Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Stills and to the first of our series of uh, film streams, Clips. Um, my name is Neil Cox, and I'm the director of the Alfred Research Partnership. Uh, the research partnership exists to do uh, research and public engagement events around the Austrian collection, which most of you will know is a collection of contemporary, mostly contemporary visual arts, uh, jointly owned by National Galleries uh, Scotland and Tate, um, and acquired through the generosity of Anthony Doffe um, and the Art Fund and the Arts Council and all these people who support it. Um, uh, Art Street is best known, of course, for this UK-wide tour of the work of individual artists in uh, rooms, in, in sort of monographic ex exhibition rooms. Um, the research partnership exists, um, as I say, to conduct uh, this kind of research activity, but we, we do lots of these kind of public events, including um, our flagship uh, series, Café des Artistes. Number 12 is coming up um, on Roy Lichtenstein um, at the uh, Scottish National Area of Modern Art, Modern One, on April the 27th, um, to coincide with the new uh, Lichtenstein acquisition in artist rooms and the exhibition that's on there. So there are 39 artists in the collection, and, and Lichtenstein is the 39th. Um, so <coughs> Clips is a departure for us to screen uh, films by, made by the artists in the collection. Quite a lot of the artists in the collection also worked as filmmakers for various reasons, um, engaging in different ways in their practice. And um, I'm delighted this evening to introduce Glyn Davis, my colleague Glyn Davis from ECA, who is an expert, um, international renown, on Andy Warhol. And uh, he's going to talk us uh, through, introduce us to this film, Horse, which has come all the way, these reels of film have come all the way from the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, and we believe, Glyn is just telling me, that he thinks that this is the first time this film has ever been shown in Scotland. Yeah. Um, possibly in the UK. Possibly in the UK. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very old, and uh, we can't always match the sound quality, but Glyn will explain more. Over <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I recently introduced a screening of Andy Warhol's film Bike Boy from 1967 in uh, Montreal, the University of Concordia, which also came from the MoMA Travelling Library. Andy Warhol's movies are really hard to see. We think, many of us, that we've seen them, possibly because you've seen five minutes of the Empire State Building on YouTube. But actually seeing his films in the flesh can be very, very tough to do. There are a very limited number of them circulating through the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And then there are also um, roughly the same movies with some add-ons and some subtractions uh, that circulate from the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. The Pittsburgh copies are digital. They're in slightly better nick. Um, the ones that come from MoMA are these. They are the Travelling Library. And these have been circulating since about 1988, the year after Andy Warhol died. In the intervening 30 years, they've got a bit grubby, and they're a bit, bit nasty. So the good thing is that you get to engage with the materiality of Warhol's 16 millimeter film stock. However, it does mean that sometimes the color will go funny, or the frames will go, or images will blur out, or the sound will be very bad. And I have to say that the screening of um, Bike Boy that I introduced uh, re relatively recently, the sound was almost inaudible. Having said that, the sound is only one component of the movie. And I thought what I'd just briefly do before the film starts is to give you some idea of what you're going to be seeing anyway. If anybody has Wi-Fi with them, like on them, you can actually find the script of this movie online really easily. <laughs> the script. Um, you'll see why that's funny when the film starts screening. Uh, but Ronald Tavell, who came up with the scenario for the film, has a website devoted to all of his work. I think it's just ronaldtavell.com. Um, but he actually has on that all of the scripts, the scenarios that he produced for Warhol, including all of the dialogue. So should you want to try and follow this along with some sort of interactive tablet type device, then the, the script is there. Alternatively, you might just want to go and look at that later on. Um, Warhol made hundreds of movies, hundreds of movies, but in a very short uh, period of time between 1963 and 1968. And for those of us who write about Warhol's movies, we often divide it into phases, particular times when he was doing very particular sorts of experiments. 
1965 and 1966, he worked collaboratively with Ronald Tavell on a series of different movies uh, called uh, such things as The Life of Juanita Castro, Hedy, and Horse. I'll tell you more about these movies should you want to know anything about them. This was shot in 1965. Most of the Warhol Tavell films are two reels long. This is a challenge, it's three reels long. At this point in his career, Warhol was not doing editing. So each reel is a take. So to prepare you initially, and this is one of the challenges of this movie, you're going to see three 33 minute takes. They are not edited. The camera does not cut away. The camera barely moves. All right? So just to be prepared, if you're hitting a point where you're thinking, wow, this shot's really static and not a great deal is going on here, it's going to keep happening and not a great deal will keep moving. The stasis is part of the aesthetic pleasure, but it's also part of its challenge. Two reels of the film are the um, scripted parts, which have a scenario involving four different characters and a horse, the titular horse. The third reel, when they realised that they had additional stock and thought it would be entertaining, involves people talking to the horse. <laughs> now, I've seen this film in various different orders, and I have to say, it doesn't really matter what order you see the reels in. <laughs> but the reel with the horse being kind of full centre is supposed to be the middle one. I'm saying that for our projectionists, just in case. Um, I'll stop there and I won't say much more. All right? Well, I'll feel it. <laughs> Go for it. Let's have the whole split. <laughs> what I will say is, um, and this is just a kind of an, an opening question to get you thinking through this content, through the content of this. Uh, this is worth thinking about as a Western. Does this qualify as a Western? As that's often the way in which the film is discussed. Generically, what do you need to make a Western, and does this therefore qualify as one? It's also worth saying that Ronald Tavell, the collaborator with Warhol, you will see in the film, he was writing the dialogue on idiot boards, and he runs across the front and holds it up in front of the characters, and they will read it, and then they'll enunciate. So there are also, between individual lines of dialogue, quite big pauses. I'm trying to prepare you as much as possible here <laughs> for what it is that you're going to be seeing. I have to say, I think this is an incredibly funny movie. The movies that, that Warhol and Tavell made together are really, really funny. But, but partly that's because of the sheer discomfort of having to wonder what it was like to be there while they were making it. Oh, and look out for Lady Sedgwick. It's the very first film that Warhol made that she appears in. She answers the phone. Thank you. This is a useful place for us to pause. If we have two 16 millimeter projectors, obviously we can see this and just transition into the next reel. But uh, I thought it would be worth pausing here, allowing some space for reflection. I can tell you a wee bit more about how this film is made as well and what it is that you're seeing. And things that you might just on the periphery of your auditory channel be picking up on. Um, there is a swinging boom that Tavell is speaking into every so often, and he is telling you who the cast are. So if you can hear that slightly more clearly than anything else, that's because he's actually got it right next to his mouth, just out of frame. Um, I'll tell you who they are in just a moment. Almost every line of dialogue that they are enunciating is a cliché, generic line associated with Westerns. So if you think that you're missing a great deal, a lot of what, you're, what, what is being said here are things like, Get out of town, get out of town, get out of town. There's gold in them thar hills, there's gold in them thar hills. Here comes the sheriff, over and over and over again. So you might have picked up on that. There are two idiot boards which they repeatedly use. One says, make love to the horse. You can probably tell when that's happening. It's when all four of them turn around and do this on the horse. <laughs> and the other one is, beat the kick, which is when they start kicking in the guy with the little tie. And every time that comes up, they all throw themselves on the floor and start having a fight. Clearly, these are the kind of two repetitive things that they thought would be good to have a moment of caressing the horse. The horse isn't very happy the first time that happens, you'll have noticed. But, um, but the, the kid gets beaten up again. Uh, that happens as quite a repeated um, element here. Okay, this film was shot on the 3rd of April, 1965, um, in the East 47th Street uh, factory. Um, the four cast members, just in case you didn't pick up on this being intoned, were Larry Latre, who's playing the kid. Um, he was a teenage runaway, possibly uh, the dealer Henry Gelzala's boyfriend, although information about his past is a little shady. 
Gregory Batcock, Batcock is playing the sheriff. Batcock's a really crucial figure in, the, in kind of the history of, of pop art, but also the 60s uh, New York art scene. He was a critic, predominantly. He wrote some fantastic essays on Warhol's movies during the 60s. Um, and it's his writing that he's now most known for, but this is one of his on-screen performances. Dan Cassidy is playing Tex. He was a poet and a friend of Jared Malanga, Warhol's assistant. And the fourth person is Tosh Carrillo, who's playing Mex, and he has some very cliché Mexican slash Hispanic lines that he, he's the one who walked forward towards the camera and said a few things. Um, but mostly those lines were kind of standard Hispanic lines of dialogue. I've often thought of this reel as being, uh, you can take a horse to the factory, but you can't make it neigh. Because I think what they're trying to do there is to get the horse to make a noise. Right? That's why the microphone is being brought in. And the horse just refuses to make noise. So they're kind of holding it near its mouth. And you get a bit of breathing, but that's pretty much all you're getting. I also wonder whether this reel needs to be thought about as kind of behind the scenes of the Western. Whether in fact what we're seeing here is kind of the pause between the story. Almost as though what we're seeing here is this is what it would be like behind the set of a Western where the trainer and the horse are just standing around. And they're kind of filling in time, waiting for the story to resume itself and the filming proper to begin all over again. Warhol was a big fan of making movies about kind of behind the scenes where you're never sure whether what you're seeing is the actual film or the making of the film itself. Uh, in 1966, he made a film called Since, which is a film of the JFK assassination. It's in very bad taste, given that it was only three years after the assassination uh, itself had occurred. It's seven reels long, it lasts three and a half hours. And the film itself is largely rehearsals for the making of a movie about the assassination of JFK, where the cast themselves can't agree on who's playing which character, where they're going to sit, how this sofa will work as the backseat of the car, and so on. Anyway, um, that's possibly why this reel looks so different. But, or it doesn't look any different, but it's got a very different character to it. It's almost as though this is the intermission or it's the behind-the-scenes footage, the kind of uh, the, the other footage that's shot to show you what goes on in between. Anyway, reel three returns us to the story. There are obviously some uh, very simple gags being played in this movie. Uh, horsing around as a kind of description of what it is that the cast are up to. The samples of opera that come in here, the, the opera is Faust. Um, but the fact that westerns are often described as horse operas is the reason I suspect that they are bringing in uh, small samples of, of opera on a tape which the cast then badly mime to or kind of uh, uh, move around to. In the last few years there's actually been quite a bit of writing uh, produced on this movie and about its significance and why it's, why it's an important part of Warhol's career. Uh, Douglas Crimp in his book Our Kind of Movie frames the film as a Western, and talks about it as a Western, and basically says, do you just need a horse? Is a horse really all that you need in order to call this movie a Western? Is that genuinely enough to kind of, uh, to, to, um, to ground this film generically? And there's a brilliant essay by John Davies um, called uh, Rambling On, which is uh, just about this movie in which he really pulls it apart, positions it in relation to Ronald Tavell's career as part of the theater of the ridiculous, and about the really unpleasant dynamic that there is operating in this final reel, which is quite sadistic, it's quite brutal. He's putting his actors through their paces, making them do things to each other that they're possibly not that happy about, but they've signed up for the film, so actually they're going to be doing this. You see this repeatedly across the things that, that the plays and movies that Tavell made. Very shortly after this, also in 1965, Warhol and Tavell made Vinyl, which is an adaptation of um, A Clockwork Orange. Adaptation. <laughs> Tavell later admitted that he hadn't even finished reading the book, but he kind of he got the idea, the gist of what it was about. And then they make their own version of the film, which largely involves Edie Sedgwick sitting lower right, kind of bopping to a bit of music, and in the foreground, uh, Jared Malanga being tortured <laughs> for 66 minutes. It's um, a really fascinating piece of filmmaking, but also makes a lot of sense in relation to this film and those extended fight sequences and the milk being thrown around and so on. Anyway. Thanks very much for coming. I wonder if anybody's got any kind of comments on this or reflections on it. Do you think it serves as a Western, which is quite a good place for us to 
open up discussion if people wanted to. Warhol, of course, made another Western. In 1968, he made a film called Lonesome Cowboys. It's much more generically a Western than this one, but even so, just as problematic in terms of its position. Anybody want to comment on the film? No? You're all blasted, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know I was as well. Um, I'm just going to say thanks very much to our projectionist. That was awesome. Thanks very much. Crew for getting hold of this print. It's actually very hard to get these movies in the country, so we'll be getting this for the first screening, but also to still hosting us this evening. Thanks very much for coming here.